if we made candy into wine? What if we took some magic liquid sugar juice, throw yeast at it, and see what comes out the other end? That's right, we're taking six of the world's favorite sodas, fermenting them into soda wine, and making the Wine for the People crew blind taste them and decide which soda is the regent of winemaking, or which ones are the least bad anyway. How hard can it possibly be? Now, it should go without saying that we don't recommend trying this at home. Homebrewing is generally legal in the countries where our viewers are based, but as with any activity, including the growth of microorganisms, there's always a slight risk that things could go wrong. The most likely outcome here is that nothing happens, but there is a non-zero percent chance that we accidentally grow something really nasty and give the team botulism. <laughs> That's the worst one yet. But hey, they gave me COVID, so fair's fair. If you want to get into making your own ferments, grab the Noma fermentation guide, do some research and experiment at your own risk. Uh, we'll be outlining our steps in detail here because it will hopefully be quite fun. But if I catch you in your shed with Demi Johns of Coca-Cola, so help me. But Simon, I hear you say, what gives you the right? Why can you commit this abomination against nature? Couple of reasons. One, I do what I want. Two, I mentioned that I'm incredibly lucky to work with incredibly talented people. Keyword here being work with. I'm not a winemaker, I'm a bartender. My profession involves taking the pre-made ingredients that these people have worked so hard on and finding exciting ways to combine them into something that will get me four stars on a TripAdvisor review. Yeah, that happens way too often. Everything was great, the gins were delicious, we had such a nice time. Four stars. Guys, little PSA. Unless, like, the bartender stabs you in the eye or pours hot oil directly into your grandmother, give your local bar a five-star review. I really appreciate it. Uh, I have previously dabbled in making my own fermentations. I've got three months worth of a chemistry degree. So if you really think about it, I'm only a small loan of a million dollars away from sending up the Zunico Yellow Wine Company and capturing the South Australian market. Um, I do, however, have a good enough idea that I can at least be professional and safe and hopefully get some kind of alcohol out of this adventure. Like, I hope people like watching it because I would say that from like a culinary experiment point of view, this has been a huge waste of time. <laughs> but this is certainly one of the more ambitious projects I've ever taken on. The fact that I have to do it all on camera is really keeping my cortisol levels in the 90s. So once again, don't try this at home. But if you want something that tastes like nectar and is a a little bit boozy, consider Magic 38. Please buy our wine, my son is very sick. How do people do this for a living? So starting as we so often do at the beginning, let's do our soda rundown. First up, we have the world's favorite sugar juice, Coca-Cola. Sadly free of the powder that gets you demonetized, this icon of the soda world is definitely as good a place to start as any. Next up, for a cheeky bit of orange wine for the boys, our Fanta, how trendy. Sprite, for that racy lemon acid indicative of the finest Fianos. And boy, do we know a thing or two about making Fiano. Shit, hang on, do we make this? Is this our wine? Esoterico that like someone spat in. Next we have Mountain Dew, the meme that started it all. I should give a shout out to Golden Hive Mead for really inspiring me to commit these crimes against God. You did a good job, hopefully we do a good job as well. Next up, we have Dr Pepper. Good old DP. Brendan was telling me just how much he loves some DP the other day. We're at the footy and we're walking down to the stadium. He's like, Simon, shot of ochre and some DP. It's a game changer. Brendan loves DP. Put that on a t-shirt. Um, the final one, which we don't have here, but I'm sure we can edit into my hand. Oh yeah. Uh, is Kool-Aid, because if we're doing a wine project, we may as well have something reminiscent of grapes. With the stars of the show lined up, let's get into the nitty gritty of what we're actually doing. If explosions and fire has taught me anything, it's that planning is half the battle, and that half assing the early steps leads to nothing but dirty glassware and good content. So I've gone to the nines with planning ahead on this one. Since we're doing a fermentation, the first thing we're going to consider is our sugar levels. Um, yeast, our fun little guys that will be making the ethanol, obviously need a good amount of sugar in order to do their work. They're basically taking the sugar, eating it, producing ethanol at the other end. The issue with sugar and soda may surprise you. It's not that there's too much, it's that there's too little. So all the sodas currently sit at about 100 grams of sugar per litre. Um, if you check our, our dew, we're looking at 12.3 per 100 mil. Uh, we can indirectly measure the sugar content of liquids by measuring their density and making some assumptions. For making rum, we'd be using bricks. Uh, with beer, we use Plato, and wine, we use Balmain. Uh, with grapes, it's pretty safe to assume that their juice is mostly comprised of water and that the vast majority of the dissolved material in that water is sugar. So before we begin, and actually throughout the whole uh, of this fermentation, we're gonna be measuring the density of our liquids using our handy dandy hydrometer, which is here floating in Mountain Dew. Um, 
sorry Caroline. And this will give us a reading of density, which we can then extrapolate out um, as a reading of sugar level. Uh, these calculations aren't perfect because there is other dissolved material that will also affect the density of the juice, such as lipids, glyphosate, lead from the irrigation lines. The upshot is that measuring Baume gives us a rough and rapid prediction of how much alcohol we can expect from a complete fermentation. The grape must be typically work with sits at about 12 to 14 Baume, which correlates to an expected ethanol content of about 10 to 13 percent ABV, depending on the list of conditions as long as my arm. Soda contains far less undeclared solute. So thanks to the laws uh, requiring ingredients lists, we can kind of assume everything in there is going to be sugar, uh, making our calculations a lot easier for this. Uh, but if we read that the labels of these and do some quick maths, we find out these sodas actually only sit at about two to five balme, meaning an expected yield of two and a half percent ABV. I know we're an alcohol channel and we need to promote responsible drinking, but come on, this is wine for the people, not middies for the kiddies. Could add extra sugar to the ferment. Golden Hive Mead did this uh, using honey in their Mountain Dew Mead. But we're not going to do that, largely because I don't want to. I want the pure artificial flavour to come barreling out of that glass, um, so instead we're going to concentrate our soda by boiling it down. It fits so much degeneracy in this thing. Mate, this is such good content. Boiling two litres of soda down to one litre will double the sugar concentration, thus the expected ABV. The exception to this rule is Kool-Aid. Um, you only get it in these tiny little packets and it demands that you add your own sugar or splendor to sweeten it. I guess because this tiny little packet that it sells it in cannot fit the recommended 200 grams of sugar per litre that they demand that they put you in. But if you just buy the packet and read it, it looks really good for you. Zero calories, great flavoured. Kool-Aid is basically healthy. Yeah. So we'll just be making that to spec since they've already put enough sugar in it for us. Here we have our Technicolor Rainbow Dream Coat of various soda concentrates. We're going to be testing the pHs of each of these. I'm going to be adjusting the samples down with our bicarb mix. Um, so here is our Mountain Dew. Uh, you can see it had initially a pH of like close to like one uh, into our 10 mil sample. We were in one mil of our bicarb solution and we have absolutely cooked it. Oh yeah, that's more the color we're looking for. pH adjusting is finally kind of done. Um, next we're gonna inoculate up with our yeast um, starter. Uh, we're gonna be going like at least one gram of yeast per liter. Um, wish me luck. Next issue we're gonna face is carbonation, but we're also defeating that by the same process. Bubbly things are obviously not ideal to be fermenting, um, but sitting and waiting for this soda to flatten sounds even more tedious than writing the script. So reducing it down is gonna accelerate this process for us as well. No bubbles left in our little syrup that's gonna be left. The other issue with fermenting their soda is their preservative content. We're trying to grow yeast culture in a high sugar environment, which doesn't sound too hard, but you will be shocked to learn that with an ideal shelf life of months or even years, Big soda has taken many steps to prevent microorganisms growing in their tasty, tasty sugar water. Uh, these preservatives are listed on the label with a three-digit code. Our EU and British viewers will note that the same does apply, but with the magic letter E. With what I'm assuming is pure coincidence, the higher the number, the easier it is for us to actually deal with said preservative. Um, you've got 300, which is ascorbic acid, 330 is citric, 331 sodium citrate, 334 tartaric acid, 338 phosphoric acid. These are all just organic acids, which preserve food and drink in one of the most simplest ways possible, by being acidic. Most microorganisms can't tolerate a pH of below 3, so if we ensure that our soda has enough acid in them, most things won't be able to grow. An exception to this rule is actually yeast, but we'll come back to that in a little bit. Essentially what we're going to do is neutralize the acid with a baking soda solution in order to create an environment which is much more welcoming for our fungi friends. The lower number preservatives are where things start to get a bit hairy. 2-1-1 is sodium benzoate, which is as tasty as it sounds. Um, it affects intracellular metabolic pathways, essentially killing the yeast from the inside out, um, which sounds like a really bad time, but it's kind of fine for our purposes, for two reasons. One, benzoate is only an effective preservative below pH 5, and we're already going above that, so it should be neutralized. Two, stress is actually good for alcohol production. Yeast usually respire in a similar way to us, taking oxygen from the air and sugar to produce energy and carbon dioxide. If you were to go for a run and you can't get enough oxygen into your cells, you produce lactic acid instead. And actually a similar pathway is used by yeast, but rather than producing acid, they produce ethanol, which is what they want. So some stress may not always be a bad thing, despite what my turn. Fuck. <laughs> it's all in the delivery. So some stress may not always be a bad thing, despite what my therapist keeps telling me. Um, our final challenger is potassium sorbate, a real nasty little failure. 
Uh, potassium sorbate interferes with the cell's DNA itself, preventing them from reproducing and leading to colony death. Um, it may also interfere with the ethanol metabolism pathway, but we're not really sure. Um, the solution to both of these problems is simply to take a reckless abandon for the lives of our army of fungi friends. Sorry guys. As previously mentioned, when used to producing alcohol, they're usually stressed and not really thinking about reproduction, each to their own I guess. We'll be using an established yeast starter culture for these ferments, similar to a sourdough starter, essentially attacking the soda with as much yeast as possible so that the sugar will get digested away even without the colony itself growing. Yeast of choice, BO213, um, the yeast that will save anything, um, any stopped fermentation, so hopefully it will work for us here. Um, having 10 grams of yeast dissolved in 100 ml of sugary water at 10 balme uh, is definitely overkill, but this is going to act as our starter. Um, and as I will mention at some point in this series, going overkill on the yeast is a really good way to work around preservatives such as potassium sorbate. This mass sacrifice method would also hopefully chew through the potassium sorbate that's in there because it's only in there in very small quantities. It's there as a preventative rather than a cure, uh, meaning the survivors can finish the fermentation surrounded by the corpses of their fallen comrades. If you think that's a bit dark for an episode about turning soda into wine, wait until you hear about what Coca-Cola does to people in a Amazon or in India or anywhere else where they think people aren't looking. All right, so now it is our turn to be the silly people. Let's get this fermentation underway. Once we've reduced our sodas, neutralized the pH using a bicarb solution. In order to neutralize our sodas at the end, as mentioned, we're gonna be using a bicarbonate solution. Uh, solids don't really like to dissolve into saturated solutions, but mixing two liquids together is pretty straightforward. Trust me, I'm a bartender. Last day, <laughs> we do have the equipment necessary to make up a solution of known concentration, titrate each of our soda concentrates and ensure we're adding the perfect amount to reach a desired pH. Or we can just fucking eyeball it. Potato, potato. Come on, kill me! Being a winery, we do have access to some pretty cool yeast strains. Uh, our flavor of the month, BO213. This is a highly tolerant yeast strain that's kind of used as a panic button for fermentations. Uh, as a wine company, we generally don't add yeast to our wine ferments. Uh, grape skins are covered in their own natural yeast. We just press them, let them ferment, really get that natural wine flavor. But every now and then things do go wrong. The fermentation could stall for whatever reason. And so having this on hand, never really a bad thing. Um, I've also mentioned that the pH isn't really gonna be ideal. So yeast, in fact, like an acidic environment, they normally thrive at about three to four pH. Raising the pH above five could present some issues, but I suspect they'll be much happier in a slightly more basic environment than one riddled with chemicals that are actively trying to kill them. We're gonna make a starter using 10 grams of yeast and 100 mils of a water sugar solution at about 10 balme. And this will be decanted into each of our ferments at the rate of three milliliters per liter. Uh, this tiny dose is way in excess of the manufacturer's recommendations, uh, but we want the excess fermentation power to overcome the preservatives, and I do want this done this year. I've foreseen no issues with using such a high quantity of yeast in our fermentation. You're not going to offend me with your taste. Yeah, it's, it, smells like, it, it smells like, it smells like pizza dough. It genuinely smells like pizza dough. Once inoculated, we're going to seal these bad boys up gently so they don't explode, uh, and let them sit for about 10 days, hopefully in the warmest place I can find. Not even been 45 minutes in the warm. And 1312 is back to life. We'll be regularly checking in on their activity, recording the balme levels, ensuring the fermentation is chugging along nicely uh, so that we can intervene if something goes wrong, which it won't. We're about a week into this. Deadline for filming is about a week away. So we kind of need to get this show on the road a little bit. Not only are we bringing back BO213 for yet more sacrificial uh, yeast buddies, we are also going to be adding some nutrients. Since adding the extra yeast and the nutri star, it's fair to say things are looking a bit more uh, scungy to steal a term from Dr. Tom. Um, whether or not this is an indicator of success, I don't know. Seriously, we're actually filming this kind of chronologically, so this Simon has no idea what's about to happen. Hopefully nothing bad. Uh, do you think that this would taste better? or Do you think these taste better or worse than what people drink in prison when they make like <laughs> toilet alcohol? I reckon this is not better. far off. After 10 days or so, it'll be time to rack off the wine from its leaves, maybe put it through a coffee filter to fine it rather than wasting bentonite on this. Um, then I'm going to slap a label on it, present the results to my colleagues, along with a handwritten apology. Um, these are going to be awful, I suspect. All right, one silly filtration step later, and we're going to act like these fluids are somehow not more turbid than they were before I put them through the coffee filters. Um, what did I just say? Maybe it was the wrong thing to do. Um, turns out I'm not very good at siphoning stuff. 
So what do we actually expect from this ludicrous foyer into alternative alcohol trends? Well, being optimistic, one thing I don't expect is failure. This smells fantastic. It also smells like the inside of like a, a Thai taxi. I've done plenty of reading and the theory seems to add up in our favor. We should be expecting a light, still wine with a big acid character, very optimistically along the lines of a Vino Verde. They all smell like pizza dough. Like they all smell exactly the fucking same and it's shit. Really sorry, Portugal. That's a horrible uh, comparison. comparison. In terms of flavor, I'm reckoning we'll have something that's bone dry, lots of primary characteristics and little to no secondary flavors. There's very little in these guys for the yeast to consume besides simple sugars, so we should avoid any funky or weird flavors that would come from esterification or oxidation. In spite of the large yeast volume that we're using, we're gonna be racking off fairly quickly after fermentation. So any autolytic flavors such as bread, butter, they should be avoided. Come out a little bit like a dilute vodka and X, where X is a diet version of your soda. With that in mind, I kind of think that Sprites will come out on top. It's a very light soda. Kind of citrusy. It's flavors that we already like in wines, so it shouldn't be that bad, maybe? Wrong. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know, I suspect that the Kool Aid is what's going to actually taste the worst. Um, even though we did buy the grape flavor Kool Aid, if you've ever smelt or tasted grape flavor Kool Aid, you will understand that they have never seen a grape before in their lives. It is a very strange flavor. I don't think it's going to play well. Um, I will stress again that I'm not expecting anything dangerous to come out of here. The these wines will be nothing less than food safe, but I do want to reiterate, you really shouldn't try this at home. Nature is scary. Leave playing God to the idiots among us. So now, one of two things is going to happen. Either we're going to come to a fun montage of me prepping our soda wine ferments, or Lockie is already cutting some B-roll of me completing the steps as I've been speaking, and this will just be the end of the video. I guess we'll check back in a week with some fermentation updates, see how things are progressing, hopefully at a rate of knots that will make even Caroline jealous. Maybe I'll finally get to make my own wine in the winery too. I guess we'll see you next time, friends. Wish me luck. Fuck. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I'll see you next time, friends. Wish me luck, and buy some Magic 38. Please.